Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to my Linux experiment. And I finally had time to play with the Pine phone. And it's been a hard video to make, since this device is clearly not meant for general consumption yet. It's a great phone, but it's still mainly meant for developers to optimize their software for it, and so I was hesitant to start making a video series to not unjustly criticize this device, seeing that it's not made for the general public yet. So I'm not going to recommend you buy this, it's just to give you my first impressions on a device that might very well change the course of how Linux is perceived by users. Well, the first question is, what is the PinePhone? And the PinePhone is an ARM-powered smartphone running full-blown Linux. This means that it doesn't run Android, it doesn't run any other OS, it runs a full-blown Linux. I'm talking Ubuntu Touch, or Pure OS, or Manjaro ARM, some real Linux distributions. The PinePhone is made by the Pine64, which is a company that makes Linux-based devices running on ARM processors. They are better known for the PineBook and the PineBook Pro, but they also make the PinePhone, obviously, and the PineTab, and the PineTime, which is a smartwatch. They also make some Raspberry Pi equivalents. These devices are mainly meant for developers uh, to try and optimize to create a Linux platform running on ARM. But some of their devices, like the Pinebook and the Pinebook Pro, are readily available for consumers, so I was really excited to see what the Pinephone had in store. Now, the phone itself comes in a really nice white box, very sleek, very minimalistic, and kind of reminiscent of what Apple does with its own packaging. Once you open the box, you get a nice disclaimer card telling you that this device is not meant for the general public, meant mainly for developers, it's very clear about that. After that, you've got the phone itself and your charging cable, but no charging brick or headphones. Honestly, I don't think it's a big issue. I wasn't expecting headphones in the box and a charging brick. We all have USB charging bricks everywhere in our houses. If we don't, there are some available everywhere for very cheap. I don't think it's really useful to provide one. Obviously, I have no idea what the phone will come in once it's generally available for the general public and when it's ready for general consumption. But I don't think that the packaging will be that much different when the product ships, since it already looks like a finished product. The PinePhone itself is a big device. It's got a 5.95 inch screen, which is too big for me, but will suit probably most people just fine. It's not the best defined screen. It's a 1440 by 720 piece, so not full HD, but it's crisp, it's vibrant, the colors are nice. It looks good generally. It also comes with a screen protector by default, which is nice. The phone weighs 190 grams, which is a bit on the heavy side, heavier than my Galaxy S10e, but for a phone that size, it's not too unusual. The screen is made of glass, and the back is made of plastic, but you'd be hard-pressed to tell that this is a cheap $200 device. Uh, it's really well made and well built. On the right side, you've got your power button and your volume rocker. On the bottom, you've got your USB charging port and a microphone, and on the top, your headphone jack. The front panel hosts a speaker and the front camera, as well as an RGB LED. All in all, it's a very simple, sleekly designed phone, and it does look pretty clean and nice. All in all, the phone feels super amazing for something that costs less than $200. The build quality and the fit and finish is amazing, and the back cover, while removable, sticks pretty close to the phone. There's no give, and you can't really bend it that much. It's, it feels sturdy, it feels solid, and honestly, in the hand, it doesn't feel much less premium than my Galaxy S10e, apart maybe from the plastic back instead of the glass back on my Samsung phone. Now, in terms of specs, the Pine phone is definitely on the lower end of the spectrum. It's got a quad-core all-winner CPU with a Mali 400 GPU and 2GB of RAM. It's got a 3000 mAh battery, a 5 megapixel rear shooter, a 2 megapixel front shooter, and its modem does 4G and LTE in most countries. It's got Bluetooth, it's got GPS and GLONASS, and it's got a Wi-Fi which is only single band and not AC, so don't expect the best speeds out there in terms of Wi-Fi connectivity. The specs are not far off from what the Librem 5 offers, but for, for $200, it's definitely very good value. So as I said, the back cover is easily removable and gives you access to the 3000 mAh battery, which is kind of big for a phone that size. And once you remove that battery, you get access to the SIM card tray and the uh, micro SD card slot. Unfortunately, the SIM card is for micro SIMs and not nano SIMs, which is what I've got. And I already played around with some adapters that will turn your nano SIM into a micro SIM, but they tend to get stuck in phones and make it very, very tricky to insert and remove SIM cards easily. So I have not played with the modem yet. Now, more interesting even are the sets of five hardware kill switches on the back of the device behind the, the back cover. These allow you to shut down the modem, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, the microphone, the front and rear shooter, and the headphone jack. 
These are not as readily accessible as what the Librem 5 offers, but they are here and they can be pretty useful if you want to make sure that nobody knows where you are or what you're doing and also if you just want to save battery life. A set of pogo pins is also present on the back and one might imagine that uh, the Pine 64 might provide uh, some separate backing back plates or charging accessories like for example a wireless charging enabled plate. Now let's go on to the software and this is where things start to get a little bit nastier. The Bind phone doesn't ship for now with anything pre-installed. It does run a post-market OS version, uh, just running a few hardware tests, but it's not really an OS that you can use to send messages and do phone calls. To do that, you have to download one of the many OSs available and flash them onto an SD card, which you can just slot in in here, and it will boot automatically from that the next time you reboot your phone. Now you get plenty of options, but the most readily available and the one I was most familiar with was Ubuntu Touch, having already used it in the days of the Nexus 5. And this software was underwhelming. Now, I wasn't expecting everything to work perfectly, but the cameras and the audio are plain just not functional at all on the Pine phone, and animations are laggy, a bit jittery, battery life is very, very low. Uh, I can stay maybe two hours with screen on and five hours idle. It makes the phone basically unusable as a daily driver, which is to be expected since it's not meant to be right now, it's meant to optimize some software. The OS, mainly Ubuntu Touch itself, runs pretty well. Like, you can get your applications, the UI is clean, simple, kind of beautiful even though it's starting to show its age a little bit. It does look pretty modern and pretty nice. And it's a fun OS to use. Now obviously the elephant in the room is the application situation. You will not get any first party support for most popular applications and this makes the Pine phone totally unusable as a daily driver for me right now. It will get better though, since the goal of this device is to provide developers a unified platform to try and develop Linux apps for. And what Purism is doing with LibHandy, which is a small library that allows you to make responsive GDK apps, and the Anbox project that allows you to run some Android applications on Linux phones or Linux devices, will make this a more viable option over time. But as of now, the application situation is terrible, I couldn't find Twitter, Freeletics, Spotify, any of the apps I use every day. That was to be expected, but it's still not a great situation nonetheless. Now you're not limited to Ubuntu Touch, obviously. You've got plenty of other OS's that you could install on it. And I played with KDE Plasma Mobile on KDE Neon, and I played with the FOSS shell developed by Purism, which was running on post-market OS. Both of these I found less advanced than Ubuntu Touch for now. Elements don't seem to size properly for the screen, some elements just disappear off the sides or the corners of the screen, animations are jittery, they're prone to crashing, they're clearly not ready, as is Ubuntu Touch, honestly. For now, I didn't find any software solution that really, really made that phone shine, and that is normal. Once again, I'm gonna repeat myself every time, but this is to be expected. This is not a consumer device, this is a device that is made for developers of these distributions, these Linux phone-focused distributions to be able to optimize and to be able to make progress on these specific devices, as well as for app developers to try and make an app ecosystem that works and works fine. And I'm not too anxious that people will manage to build an amazing Linux-friendly smartphone ecosystem pretty soon. Now, when I ordered the Pine phone, I was super excited and at the same time, I wasn't expecting much. On the hardware front, I am not disappointed. I am ecstatic that this company has produced such an amazing looking and feeling phone. It feels good, it feels sturdy, it doesn't feel ultra premium, and it's not extremely fast, but it's a super competent device, and for the price, it punches way above its weight, it's super, super nice to use. On the software front though, I'm a bit disappointed. I had hoped that it, since the days of Ubuntu Touch and the, uh, the Nexus 5, for example, these versions of uh, mobile Linux would have progressed a little bit more, and this hasn't been the case. I can't blame developers for that, since they didn't have a unified platform and they didn't have many users interested in testing, reporting bugs and creating applications. I hope this will change now that these devices, like the Pine Phone, the Librem 5 and maybe other smartphone manufacturers, will start getting an interest in Linux itself. And I hope it's the case, I hope these distros progress nicely and fast. So in the end, would I recommend you buy the Pine Phone right now? If you're not a developer, an app developer, or a super extreme Linux enthusiast willing to just throw your whole workflow and phone down the toilet and try to relearn something entirely new which is not working completely fine right now, no, you shouldn't. It's too soon. And the Pine64 has been clear about that. It's not a general purpose device yet. 
So I hope you guys enjoyed these first impressions of the Pine Phone. I will try and expand and make reviews on the various OS's as far as they progress and they release new versions. Now if you like the video, don't hesitate to drop a like, a subscribe, or even turn on notifications. If you really did like the video, I have a Patreon page. I'll leave a link in the description below. Patrons get access to a monthly Patreon cast where I talk about Linux, life stuff, some stuff that I do with the channel, some purchases I made, everything that concerns me, the channel, or Linux. And you also get to vote on various topics each month to define the direction the channel will go in the month after that. And for those interested, you can also get your names in the credits or simply get access to the sources for all the videos in the main channel. Check it out using the link in the description below. In the meantime, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!